The Joe Rogan Experience. It's such a good movie. Thank you. It's so good because it's so like you can see how he would be like that. You could see how he would be drawn to go back there. You could see how the pull of it all and the chaos of it all. And then there's a scene where he's, I believe he's in a supermarket. Mm-hmm. And it's just fucking boring. Mm-hmm. Life is just the mundane, normal life. And he just wants to go back to war. Yeah. It's, it, and I'm like, I'm, I buy it all in, you know? It's like, it's very rare that, you know, you see him, there's like no suspension of disbelief. You buy him, you, you're watching that film and you're like, whoa. Like, I could see. Well, that was a big part of what we were trying to do was to, was to, so I had been in, I had been in Baghdad as a reporter in 2004, I guess. And, um, I had seen some of what what's depicted in the in the film, and so I had witnessed the bomb squad going out and defusing bombs, and then and I wrote an article about it, and then um, the idea came along for a screenplay. I had the idea to write a screenplay, put it that way, and my whole thing is over the course of a year, I didn't know how to write a screenplay, but my whole thing is I was learning how to do it and doing rewrites was to try to replicate the experience that I had, that I felt when I was there, okay? So to do that, there was a lot of craft and whatnot involved in, how to, in, in creating that, that I had to learn. But it also meant breaking a lot of rules of narrative and storytelling that you normally would do to make a movie effective, but that in this case may, would have made it less authentic to the experience. Like one, for example, is that most war movies are organized around a mission. It's like in the beginning of the movie, you're told, hey, this is what we gotta do, and then the rest of the movie plays out, like Saving Private Ryan or what have you. And when I was in Baghdad, one of the things I was struck by was the this ceaseless, like, hamster wheel repetition of the war. That it wasn't organized around a single mission, it was this futile attempt to try to find all these bombs that had been dispersed throughout the country by the counterinsurgency. So I couldn't organize it around a mission. I had, at least in my mind, to keep it authentic. I had to kind of make the story similar enough to the reality, which was like every day a new mission, like a kind of, you know, um, episodic structure, they call it. So there are all these decisions along the way that get made to create that feeling that you have where you go, oh, I can suspend, I can suspend my disbelief because this feels, this feels real. And then there's the point at which, like you do all this research, I did all that research of actually going there, hanging out with these guys, talking to them, witnessing what they were doing, trying to get deep inside of it, learning about IEDs and how they work and really getting inside their mentality hanging out with them. And then there's another point at which you kind of put yourself into the piece too. And it's funny that you mentioned the scene at the end. And it's, it's been really instructive to me because uh, when I was doing screenings for the Hurt Locker, a lot of times at the end of the screening, like a, a vet would come up and that scene in the grocery store where Sergeant James, that's the character name, was like kind of first time back from the war and he's he's like overwhelmed by the commercialism of the supermarket and all the choices of cereal. And it's not just that it's boring, it's that it's like so meaningless compared to what he'd just been doing. And he can't he can't function. And you've seen this guy operate on such a high level for the past, whatever it is, hour and a half. Yeah, there's a scene right there. Oh. And you can't choose, you know? All this, like, uh, consumer shit. It was such a good representation of what these guys have to go through. But my... Sorry. And Renner is so good there, too. He's amazing. But that, that actual thing had happened to me coming back I felt this sense of dislocation 
and I was only there for like a couple of weeks, but I felt this sense of like how surreally grotesque like certain parts of our wealth are after you're in after you see this poverty and you see the hardship of the war. So that was like my thing. That wasn't like a research thing. Mm. And it's just interesting. It was like totally from my heart. And I remember putting it in and thinking, this is one of the rare things in the movie that like I didn't get from reporting. And it actually turned out to be one of the things that translated the most to other people. And it kind of taught me about like, well, sometimes if you just dig deep enough, probably there's a chance anyway that like your experiences or my experiences, if you're really being honest about them, and this goes back to where we started this conversation, will translate to other people. Mm. Even if you don't, even if you think they're super hyper fucking specific to you. Yeah. It's, Does that make sense? Yes. It might be hyper specific so, so that's to you, what but I'm, it's so, very relatable. It's yeah, relatable because- It is in retrospect, but yes. at the time I was like, this is just a weird thing that happened to me. No, nah, but you nailed it. Because you, because and, in the context of the movie, you know, you see that this guy is, I mean, every time he's defusing a bomb, this could be it. And he's over there in this, this chaos ridden war zone. And then he comes back and he's wandering through a supermarket aisle. It was perfect. It was the perfect juxtaposition. And it really does. And you, you, you do relate to it because I think all of us are aware that you kind of get accustomed to whatever you're around. You know, you get accustomed to a chaotic home life or a peaceful home life. You get mm -hmm. a, a very busy workplace where things, people are yelling at each other and everything's constantly moving fast mm -hmm. or boring, droning, cubicle life. Mm -hmm. Like people understand that there's like certain ways of living and existing that you can get accustomed to. And they kind of make sense when you've adju adjusted and adapted to them. But then... To have such a clear difference between being in a war zone and being in a supermarket, mm -hmm. it was it was perfect. Well, thanks. I'll take that. Yeah, no, it was really good, man. It's like what what does it feel like to have the responsibility of trying to relay one of the most complex aspects of human life, which is war. It's funny when you said perfect, I just flashed on, not to not answer your question, but I, f I remember there was some reviewer at the time that called it a near perfect movie. Oh. And I remember calling him up and being like, near perfect? Why are you just, <laughs> what the fuck? Like, is that near really necessary? <laughs> well, because I want to put it on the, uh, I, I wanted to put it on the DVD. Anyway, we did. We left it on there. It's still, I mean, um, you know, but it's hard for someone to say something's absolutely perfect. No, of course, and it's it's stupid. Nothing yeah. is perfect. But, <laughs> it's funny though that but you I just, called I just, them up. When you said perfect. What I the was, fuck, like, bro? Near what's perfect? Ne what's near? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what more do you want? Yeah. No, I do feel the sense of responsibility. I mean, I think that, uh, I think we're all responsible. I think whether you're doing a topic like that where I tend to do real life stuff, although the this m most recent thing is fictional. I, I think that anybody in the media has a huge sense of responsibility that comes with the territory, whether they feel it or not, or take it on. I don't know. I, I think it would be nice if we lived in a world where people felt more responsible. Cause I think a lot of what is put out there is very irresponsible. And I'm not even talking about like with true stories of like history where you're distorting history. That's obviously irresponsible, but there's so much, of our cultural production, the corporate production that is, in my view, irresponsible. I take the responsibility seriously just because I know in that case there are, there are people, um, the, there were people that were still downrange and in harm's way. So there were all kinds of things that I, t I was careful to not depict because I didn't want to put anybody, like that's the most basic level of responsibility, right? Nobody should get hurt because you burned some classified thing. So like in terms of like tactics that are used? Tactics or like there was, um, at the time in the war, there was there was a, um, there there was this like jamming system that was, that was um, used to help um, prevent like remote detonation of, of these IEDs, electronic jamming systems. And I didn't depict that at all. 
Mm. And then after the movie came out, a bunch of army guys were like, that wasn't realistic. I'm like, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it is super realistic, but yes, I left some things out. Because, yeah, that makes because sense. Because so. people called me and they were like, dude, you can't put that in. That, right. would, that would be bad. Yeah. So there's that level of responsibility, but then there's another responsibility to, to more like mystical things like truth and history. Mm. Um, which I also feel pretty acutely. What do, when you talk about irresponsible depictions, like what what do you mean by that? I I mean I think that like I think that media is really important, like to our culture, to our to our civilization, and one way to think about it is like. There's more responsibility now around, let's say, portraying diversity. We've we've gotten a lot better at at least trying to make movies and television shows that are more reflective of like what the country really looks like. But there's other areas where I don't see that same level of responsibility. One is like the obvious one that that the right talks about all the time is like depiction of guns and violence where there's just so much and I, I mean I have violence in the show I'm not I'm not like saying like and I and I I'm not like anti firearm or anything but 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 there's so much irresponsible kind of taking heavy shit that has real consequences and aestheticizing it is irresponsible to me mm. it's fucked and um and per, and there's that's a kind of abuse of I think of like the responsibility that 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 comes with the power of telling stories. When you're telling a story, like in a way, it's it's a kind of like remote teaching. You're kind of putting something out in the world and saying like this is how it is. So that's that's another one is like plot. People abuse plot all the time, which which kind of bugs me because if I'm telling you a story and I and the plot is so radically disconnected from how things really work. I'm not talking about science fiction, but even within science fiction, if I posit to you like here's here are the set of rules of this story and then I break them, I think that's really irresponsible because it's fucking with people's heads. It's like mm. making them dumber in a certain way that I mean it would take me a while to explain, but these are the kinds of things that I think about sometimes. <laughs> no, it, it makes sense. Like you're trying to do a film that's impactful, but it's also you, it's it's easy to follow because you understand that this is how people behave and this is how it really go down. So Here's an example. Like if I made a movie about Iraq where you ended up feeling like really good about the war. Mm. Like a feel-good movie about the war. Yeah. Happens all the time. Yeah. You know, I think that's irresponsible. Not that there aren't like amazing stories of heroism and not that there aren't moments about that war to feel good about, but the overall gist of it is it, it, it like was um, uh, a catastrophe. How is it managing that when you're dealing with studios and executives and all these different people and the, you know, like they, is it difficult to get people on board with what you're trying to, to do? You're really trying to make it authentic and I don't really I Typically I haven't really messed with any of that stuff like we, we made those movies uh, Catherine Bingo and I made those movies like independently. Oh, that's nice. So we had Well, that makes it was sense. like very cowboyish, you know, I mean yeah. we had financing from from a whole bunch of different places like we pre-sold the foreign rights I and mean, this is getting inside baseball, but we never had to deal with like a Fox or a Universal mm. or a Sony. And even when we made Zero Dark Thirty, that was financed by one person, Megan Ellison, who just wrote a check. Jesus. What a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love Megan. Shout out to Megan. Yeah. That's a crazy move. How much did that movie cost? Uh it depends how you if it depends if you include the production budget, I think it was around forty. Wow. Million dollars. And then promotion, I think she put up another 20 something. 
Yeah, it's pretty big money. Luckily, it worked. <laughs> I know. I lost some money. I lost a lot of her money on Detroit. So. Oh, did you? But, but she made a lot on um, on Zero Dark Thirty.